Welcome to the Handy Philosopher uh, YouTube channel where I read philosophy texts to you. Um, I am going to be starting off uh, Plato's Gorgias um, today, so this is quite an enjoyable little exchange between, primarily between um, Socrates and Callicles, uh, and yeah, you get to see some nice jabs on, on either side. Um, so it's very different to other um, philosophical texts you might have read. Plato wrote in dialogue form, and this one is presented as a, you know, Socrates lines and then Callicles lines, uh, essentially. So, um, yeah, it's quite enjoyable. And uh, there's, because it's written almost like a play, there's a lot of filler dialogue. Um, so if you compared it to something like an Aristotle text, which is very sort of dry and to the point, um, not to say that it's bad, but you know, it's almost like a textbook. Um, Plato's dialogues are a little bit more engaging. There's a little bit of uh, interaction between the um, the interlockers. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a bit of good fun. Um, I'm going to be going from 480A. If you have a look at the, um, uh, the numerical uh, listings on the side of the page, um, so sort of beside the writing. Uh, so... To provide a bit of background, um, Gorgias uh, is set, um, well, it's supposed to be a conversation that was had amongst a whole group of people. Gorgias was a famous orator, a famous public speaker. Uh, he'd come into town to do some talks. He was sort of like a celebrity of the day. Um, and afterwards, they were at sort of someone's house and, you know, Socrates was there and Callicles was there and Gorgias was there and so they sort of end up getting into a conversation with each other about a whole range of things uh, and Socrates sort of takes on a few different people winning all of them of course um, we're focusing on the section where he talks to Callicles okay and so to start off with this section um, is going to be looking at what role rhetoric plays in our lives. So rhetoric was really important in ancient Greece because it was your ability to speak publicly. Um, in a direct democracy, this really determines how much power you gained and, and how influential you were in society. You know, you could decide whether the Athenians went to war. You could decide um, what happened to people. You know, you could be directly involved in the justice system uh, in the form of a jury, a jury that is. Um, and on top of that, they also used a lot system for determining positions of power. So anyone could be drawn out to be, you know, the person who oversees the political system, for example, and this would rotate around. So it was really important to be able to do these sorts of things um, for young men in ancient Greece. Um, Socrates, of course, doesn't value rhetoric very highly. Uh, and he says that people really only use um, uh, use rhetoric to uh, get away with doing the wrong thing. Um, so he's quite disparaging of rhetoric uh, and doesn't really like it. Um, it's at this point that uh, Callicles, the person that Socrates is going to be having an argument with, um, enters the discussion. Uh, Callicles is quite disparaging of Socrates and sees him as a bit of an idiot. So Let's get cracking. Um, it's a sort of long section, but uh, with the dialogue, it sort of doesn't feel as long. You get a bit of back and forward and a few witty remarks. So um, we'll start off with uh, Socrates finishing off what he's saying to another person who was there, a student named Polus, um, and then Callicles entering the fray. Um, so pens and highlighters at the ready. Um, Socrates concludes his bout with Polus by reintroducing rhetoric and arguing not without irony. Uh, that it should not be used to ev uh, evade punishment for one's crimes, but on the contrary, for getting one's family and friends punished when they have done nothing wrong, and for getting one's enemies acquitted for any crimes they have committed, because that is worse for them than being punished. It is worth noting here that little part, not without irony. Um, you know, Socrates is most famous for quoting, all that I know is that I... Uh, is that I do not know anything or that I know nothing. Um, a lot of people, when they read Plato's dialogues, they think that Socrates is presenting an argument. Most of the time, all he's really doing is showing that the people he's arguing against don't know what they're talking about. Um, and so 
a lot of the times he uses you know extreme examples or you know sort of dirty tricks in arguing but this is really just to show that the other person's argument is flawed i mean if it was a good argument it would be able to survive those sorts of things and it doesn't so it's worth taking some of the things that socrates says um maybe not entirely seriously does he really mean what he's saying some of the times maybe not particularly when he's being really extreme with his views but um i think it's fair to say that he uh what he's really trying to do is show you that the person he's arguing with who is saying that they do know something is actually the one who's wrong okay not so much that he's right but his opponent is wrong okay um so here we go socrates all right then if what we've been saying is true polis what particular use is rhetoric what i'm getting at is this we've reached a point in the discussion where we're bound to say that our chief concern should be to avoid doing wrong because of all the bad consequences it'll bring us do you agree yes so socrates here is not saying anything controversial we should avoid doing the wrong thing what if a person does do wrong however or if someone he cares for does he should go of his own free will to where he'll find the swift, swiftest possible punishment that is he should appear before a judge as he would before a doctor and he should hurry to make sure that the ailment which is immorality does not become entrenched rot his mind and make it incurable i don't see what else we can say polis as long as our earlier conclusions remain unshaken if we want what uh, we're saying now to be consistent with what we were saying before we can't put it any other way can we uh, no of course uh, we can't socrates um, replies polis so socrates here has said like if you've done the wrong thing you should actually seek out justice as quickly as possible um, because that will cure you from the worst of all positions, which is being immoral. And you want to do that quickly because immorality, according to Socrates, is a little bit like a disease. The longer that it's in you, the more it grows, and then the harder it will be to cure. So you should seek, um, you should seek punishment or justice, depending on how you're going to put it, as quickly as possible whenever you do the wrong thing. Um, continuing on, oh, they talk about like what we've agreed upon before. What they've agreed upon beforehand is that um, being immoral is the worst condition of all. Okay, so doing wrong is the worst thing that you can do. Um, uh, so because he's agreed to that, Socrates, using the, what's called the Socratic method, is now painting Polis into a corner where he has to now sort of contradict something else he said. Um, uh, so this rules out using rhetoric to defend wrongs, Polis, whether they're being committed by ourselves, our parents, friends, children, or country. We could only find a use for rhetoric, in fact, on the opposite assumption, that our first priority should be to denounce ourselves, and then secondly, any of our family and friends who happen to be doing wrong at any time, and that we should make any crime they commit public rather than concealing it, so that they can pay the penalty for it and get uh, get well again. So it's kind of like dragging someone to the doctor um, when uh, they're sick, but they don't want to go. If someone you know commits a crime, you should take them to the police and hand, forcibly hand them in because you want to cure them of their immorality. Okay, And just like you take them to the doctor to cure them of their illness, you're going to cure them of their immorality. Uh, from this point of view, we should require ourselves and everyone else not to flinch, but to put a brave face on uh, on it and submit courageously and fearlessly uh, to the cuttery and surgery of the doctor, as it were. With our sights set on goodness and morality, we should take no account of the pain. That's a nice little quote there. Um, uh, we should submit to the lash if that's what the crime warrants, or to imprisonment if that's what we deserve. If we're fined, we should pay up. If we've earned exile, we must go. If the penalty is death, we should let ourselves be executed. Uh, we should be the first to denounce ourselves and the people close to us, and the use uh, to which we should put rhetoric is to expose their crimes and save them from the worst of all conditions, which is immorality. Shall we commit ourselves to this view, Polis, or not? It sounds extraordinary to me, Socrates, but I suppose to your mind it fits in with what we were saying earlier. So Polis here is kind of playing along with Socrates. Um, I doubt that he actually agrees with him. But um, what Socrates is talking about is imagine the person you care about the most commits a crime 
and the punishment for that crime is death. What Socrates is saying is if you really cared about this person, you would take them to the police, you would hand them in, and you would want the, uh, the execution to take place. As painful as that would be for you, the worst possible thing is that the person gets away with that crime because then they have become immoral and that illness will eat away at them and it will destroy the person that they actually are. Um, instead, they should seek justice. And if that means being put to death, then if it will cleanse their immoral soul, this is something that is good, not bad. Um, uh, so, Socrates, the only choice we've got then is between undermining those earlier conclusions or accepting this view as their logical consequence. Yes? Yes, that's right. Uh, now, taking the converse situation and assuming that, in fact, one should harm anyone, uh, an enemy, for instance, then as long as you aren't having wrong done to you by a given enemy, which is something to watch out for, and he's doing wrong to someone else instead, you have to use all your verbal and practical resources to try and ensure that he does not get punished and does not appear before a judge. And if an enemy of yours does appear there, you have to come up with a way for him to escape and so avoid punishment. If he's stolen a pile of money, you have to make sure he doesn't give it back, but keeps it and spends it in uh, godless immorality on himself and his acquaintances. If death is the penalty for his crime, you have to keep him alive, preferably forever, so that he never dies and his iniquity goes on and on. But if you can't manage that, you better ensure he lives in his state of wickedness for as long as possible. Now, all of the you can see the hyperbole um, that Socrates is using here. He's talking about trying to keep your enemy alive for as long as possible. Um, Socrates, this is a discussion about the usefulness of rhetoric, okay? And Socrates is quite tongue-in-cheek saying, well, this is what rhetoric would be really useful for. Find your enemy and then try and make sure that they're allowed to do as many bad things as possible because the worst condition we can possibly have is that of an immoral soul. And therefore, our if our enemy has an immoral soul, we should try and keep them in that state for as long as possible because this is the worst possible thing that could happen to them. Um, you know, try and keep them alive forever in that immoral state, according to Socrates. He's being very tongue-in-cheek here, okay? We're not supposed to take this seriously. What he's pointing out is that rhetoric, the idea that rhetoric can be used for good um, is highly questionable, according to Socrates, uh, okay? And it's a little bit tough at this point because we've come in halfway through an argument, but with Callicles, um, who jumps in next, it will become much clearer, okay? Uh, these are the kinds of circumstances in which I think rhetoric has some use, Polis. I can't see that any particular use, uh, it, sorry, I can't see that it's any particular use to a person with no criminal intentions. Maybe it's no use at all in that situation. Nothing came up in the previous discussion to make us think it is. So Socrates, is re what he's really saying to Polis is, there's really only two genuine uses for rhetoric, and a good person shouldn't need either of them. Firstly, if you genuinely want to use rhetoric for good, you would use it to get justice done to you or to your friends when they do the wrong thing. But a good person wouldn't do the wrong thing, and they wouldn't surround themselves with bad people, so therefore they're never going to need rhetoric for that person. Uh, that purpose. The next one is to see your enemies never get justice. But this is actually working against justice, okay, which is a bad thing in itself. And so a good person would never actually want to do this. They wouldn't want to stand in the way of justice. They would actually want their enemies to be cured of their immorality because this is the right thing. And so um, Socrates is basically saying there's two uses for rhetoric, to punish yourself when you do the wrong thing or to save your enemies from punishment when they've done the wrong thing. A good person would use neither of them and so rhetoric is totally useless for a good person. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Uh, all right, here we go. The big heavyweight bout, Callicles is about to jump in here. So, in exasperation, Callicles joins the fray. He cannot believe that Socrates seriously holds these revolutionary views. Socrates replies in metaphorical language that he is certainly voicing his inner convictions. And contrast this uh, with the worldly Socrates' obligation to voice only what accords with the changing whims of the populace. Uh, 
basically Socrates says, well, I've said this all along. You are the one who constantly changes your point of view. Um, so yes, I am serious when I say this. You're the one who changes all the time. Callicles locates uh, Polus's mistake as conceding that doing wrong is more disgraceful than suffering it. He claims that this view is merely a convention designed by the weak to suppress the strong and argues that might is right by natural law. Socrates' uh, aberrant, uh, sorry, aberrant views, he claims, are due to overindulgence in intellectual pursuits rather than worldly experience. Callicles ends his long and famous speech with a prophetic warning that if Socrates ever finds himself in court, his impracticality will leave him incapable of defending himself, which of course is a reference to the image that was at the start of this um, slideshow. Uh, Socrates being put to death on false charges. Um, so remember, this is all written after the fact, so Plato is putting this in uh, on purpose. Um, so whilst Callicles obviously couldn't have known that Socrates was going to be killed, Plato writing this does know that Socrates um, gets brought up on false charges and does get killed. So it is in there for a purpose. Okay. Um, so here we go. Uh, Callicles. Tell me, uh, Sherophon, is Socrates serious or is he having us on? Um, Sherophon is sort of, uh, I think he, from memory, he's one of Socrates' um, students who's come along to this. Uh, Seraphon, I think he's perfectly serious, but there's nothing like asking the man himself. Callicles, all right, I'd certainly love to do that. Socrates, may I ask you a question? Are we to take it that you're serious in all this or are you having us on? You see, if you're serious, and if what you're saying really is the truth, surely human life would be turned upside down, wouldn't it? Everything we do is the opposite of what you imply we should be doing. Um, so Callicles is here um, using the argument, uh, sort of, you know, what's referred to as the naturalistic fallacy, that that which is natural is correct. Um, and he's saying that Ca Socrates' argument must be wrong because it's so unnatural. Uh, Socrates... Uh, replying here. Callicles, if there weren't areas of overlap within all the individual variety of human experience, if a person's experiences were private and couldn't be shared by others, it wouldn't be easy to communicate one's own experience to anyone else. I say this because I have an idea that you and I do in fact share an experience, that of having two loves each. I love Alcibiades, the son of uh, Cleine Cleinius, um, and philosophy, and your two loves are the Athenian populace and Demis, the son of uh, Pyrolampes. Okay, so basically Socrates here has said, I've got two loves in my life, my son and philosophy, you've got two loves of your life, the Athenian people and your son. Um, let's now continue on. Uh, now, you're terribly clever, of course, but all the same, I've had occasion to notice that you're incapable of objecting to anything your loved ones say or believe. You chop and change rather than contradict them. If the assembly of the Athenian people refuse to accept an idea of yours, you change tact and, and say uh, what they want to hear. And your behavior is pretty much for the same with that good-looking lad of uh, Pyrolampes. Uh, for instance, you're so incapable of challenging your loved one's decisions and assertions that if anyone were to express surprise at the extraordinary things they cause you to say once in a while, you'd probably respond, if you were in a truthful mood, by admitting that it's only when someone stops them voicing these opinions that you'll stop echoing them. Uh, so Socrates here is basically saying, look, you know, you're a man who can't say no to the Athenian people. And you just, you're just a mirror for their own um, ideas and their own opinions. You're just parroting back whatever they say. Um, and so because of that, um, you chop and change all the time. Uh, Socrates is going to say, I love philosophy. And that means I stay consistent because philosophy never changes its mind. Okay, that's what's going to come up next. Uh, and that's more or less what you're bound to hear from me as well, you know. So rather than expressing surprise at the things I've been saying, you should stop my darling philosophy voicing these opinions. You see, my friend, she's constantly repeating the same views you've just heard from me, and she's far less fickle than my other love. 
I mean, Alcibiades says different things at different times, but philosophy's views never change. And what you're finding puzzling at the moment is typical of what she says. You were here throughout the discussion, however, so it's up to you uh, either to prove her wrong by showing, as I said a short while ago, that wrongdoing, particularly unpunished wrongdoing, uh, is not absolutely the worst thing that can happen, or to leave this notion unrefuted. But if you leave it unrefuted, then I swear to you by the divine dog of the Egyptians that it'll cause friction between you and Callicles. He's saying, like, between yourself. Um, Callicles, there'll be discord within you your whole life. And yet, my friend, in my opinion, it's preferable for me to be a musician with an out-of-tune lyre or a choir leader with a cacophonous choir. And it's preferable for almost everyone in the world to find my beliefs misguided and wrong rather than for just one person me to contradict and clash with myself. So Socrates here is basically throwing down the challenge to Callicles and saying, hey, you think that my views are crazy? Prove me wrong. But if you're going to do that, actually stick to an argument because you constantly change when you talk at the assembly uh, in front of the Greek people. So I'm good to go if you are, buddy. But, uh, but get ready because I'm really going to hold you to your um, point of view. Um, Callicles, of course, being a prideful man, takes the bait. Um, Callicles, spoken like a true popular orator, I'd say Socrates. Oh, this is basically like saying, you know, that Socrates is like a sort of like the Justin Bieber of public speakers. Like there's no like value or merit to what they're doing. They're just producing things to sound good, uh, you know, to essentially to sell records. There's no genuineness behind their music um a popular orator was someone who was a popular public speaker but it's like they they'd say anything like they didn't actually believe in what they were saying they were just really good at public speaking um uh, and so yeah uh, a bit like a pop artist uh but um so all that passion, but it's only because what's happened to Polis is exactly what happened to Gorgias, and Polis told Gorgias off for letting you manipulate him into that situation. You asked Gorgias whether he'd teach morality to a hypothetical pupil of his who had come to learn rhetoric and didn't already know what was right and what was wrong, and Gorgias, according to Polis, was embarrassed into saying that he would because people would typically be offended if anyone said that he couldn't teach it. It was a result of this concession that he was forced to contradict himself, and Polis went on to point out uh, that this is exactly the situation you relish. He was mocking you then, and I think he was right to do so. But now it's his turn. Exactly the same thing has happened to him. So Callicles is quite rightly pointing out um, the Socratic method here. Socrates gets his opponent to define his terms very precisely. He then finds an exception to that definition and uh, makes his opponent try and justify um, the exception and maintain the uh, definition, which can't happen because they contradict each other. This goes around in circles a few times until his opponent basically has to give up and say that he doesn't know anything. Okay. Um, we get a nice little summary of the argument that's occurred before this point there. Um, so a little bit of conversation between Gorgias, Polis, and Socrates. Um, but remember, our focus is Callicles and Socrates. So let's continue. To be specific, where I think Polis was at fault was in agreeing with you that doing wrong is more contemptible than suffering wrong. Now, this is an important conclusion because we can't circle all the way back around to this conclusion at the end of the piece. So Socrates has asserted that doing wrong is more contemptible or worse than suffering wrong. In other words, if you're choosing between being the victim of crime and being the criminal, it's better to be the victim of crime, okay? Because doing the wrong thing is much worse than suffering the wrong thing. Uh, it was this admission of which enabled you to tie him up in logical knots and muzzle him. He was just too embarrassed to voice his convictions. You pretend that truth is your goal, Socrates, but in actual fact, you uh, you steer discussions towards this kind of ethical idea, ideas which are unsophisticated enough to have popular appeal and which depend entirely on convention, not nature. So this is an important part of the argument, convention versus nature. Convention is what is commonly held by the people. 
um, sort of the laws or the norms of society, whereas nature is what we find in nature. Okay. Um, uh, they're in, invariably opposed to each other, you know, nature and convention. I mean, and consequently, if someone is too embarrassed to go right ahead and voice his convictions, he's bound to contradict himself. This, in fact, is the source of the clever but unfair argumentative trick you've devised. Uh, if a person is talking from a conventional standpoint, so arguing for the laws of society, you slip in a question which presupposes a natural point of view. Um, and if he's talking about nature, you substitute convention. On this matter of doing and suffering wrong, for instance, to take the case at hand, Polis was talking about what was more contemptible from a conventional standpoint, but you adopted the standpoint of nature in following up what he said, because in nature everything is, is more contemptible if it is also worse, as suffering wrong is, whereas convention ordains that doing wrong is more contemptible. In fact, this thing, being wronged, isn't within a real man's experience. Now, this is like Callicles really saying what power is, okay? Um, so being wronged or having, you know, having crime committed um, against you isn't within a real man's experience. It's something which happens to slaves who'd be better off dead because they're incapable of defending themselves or anyone else they care for against unjust treatment and abuse. So... Uh, Callicles here is building up a bit of a tirade against uh, Socrates. He said that um, he believes that uh, Socrates basically arg argues dirty, and whenever his opponent is arguing from a natural point of view, Socrates uses a conventional or you know the laws of society point of view, and whenever their his opponent is arguing from a conventional point of view he uses a natural point of view it basically he's just trolling his opponent um, but remember all that I know is that I know nothing Socrates isn't actually arguing a point he's just trying to f show you that his opponent doesn't know what he's really saying okay um, on top of that, Socrates is going to point out that he actually hasn't done that in this case. Um, that convention and nature both agree that he is right, that it is worse to um, to do wrong than to suffer wrong. But that'll come later, much later in the piece. Okay. Uh, um, what we get now is the real might is right argument. So the last dot point on this screen. Um, from Callicles, uh, and he starts to talk about the weak of society. Um, so, in my opinion, it's the weaklings who constitute the majority of the human race who make the rules. In making these rules, they look after themselves and their own interests, and that's also the criterion they use when they dispense praise and criticism. They try to cow the stronger ones, which is to say the ones who are capable of increasing their share of things, and to stop them getting an increased share. Uh, by saying that to do so is wrong and contemptible, and by defining injustice in precisely those terms as the attempt to have more than others. Um, so just to pause here, Callicles is really teeing off at weak people, or people who he perceives to be weak, um, and saying that they write the laws of society. This is why, according to society's laws, it's worse to have wrong done uh, sorry, it's worse to do wrong than to have wrong done to you because they're weak and they want to feel good. They don't want to feel like bad people. So when someone who's weak has a crime committed against them, they sort of go, oh, you know, but at least it could be worse. I could be the criminal. Look at that terrible person. For Callicles, what they should be saying is, I am so weak that I couldn't stop this. And a real person, okay, a person with real power would be able to stop it. Um... Uh, in my opinion, it's because they're second rate that they're happy for uh, things to be distributed equally. Anyway, that's why convention states that the attempt to have a larger share than most people is immoral and contemptible. That's why people call it doing wrong. But I think we only have to look to, at nature to find evidence that it is right for better to have a greater share than worse, more capable than less capable. The evidence for this is widespread. Other creatures show, as do human communities and nations, that right has been determined as follows. The superior person shall dominate the inferior person and have more than him. By what right, for instance, did Xerxes make war on Greece or his father on Scythia? 
not to mention countless further cases on the same kind of behaviour. These people act surely in conformity with the natural essence of right, and yes, I'd even go so far as to say that they act in conformity with natural law, even though they presumably contravene our man-made laws. So what Callicles is saying here is if we're really trying to determine what is right, what is good, what does a good person look like, a good person has the power to take what they want when they want it, um, according to Callicles. Okay, They have the power to do what they will. And you know, he makes a lot of links to the natural world, so it's worth looking at um, you know, an animal example, uh, you know, something like a pride of lions, for example. Okay, who eats first? The the head of the pride, the head lion eats first. And why do they eat first? Because no one else is powerful enough to stop them in the pride. As soon as that day comes, that lion gets challenged, and they will either win and maintain their position, or they'll be pushed out. This, according to Callicles, is what is right. When you get a truly gifted leader, so he's referenced Xerxes here, which if you've seen the movie 300, um, they're referencing uh, the king of Persia, Xerxes, who makes war on Greece, and you know that's when he's attacking Sparta. Um, later on, he attacks all of Greece. Uh, but um, what Callicles is saying is, Xerxes was right in trying to um, attack Greece and take over because he was really strong and no one could stand in his way. And you know what happened when the Greeks did stand in their way? They beat Xerxes. Okay, And so this is what might is. Might is right. If you're strong enough, you'll be able to withstand the barrage. Okay. Uh, um, so he now sort of turns his uh, his attention to what society does with these really strong people, particularly when they're young. Uh, what do we do with the best and strongest among us? We capture them young like lions, mould them and turn them into slaves by chanting spells and incantations over them, which insists that they have to be equal to others and that equality is admirable and right. But I'm sure that if a man is born in whom nature is strong enough, he'll shake off all these limitations, shatter them to pieces, and win his freedom. He'll trample all our regulations, charms, spells, and unnatural laws into the dust. This slave will rise up and reveal himself as our master, and then natural right will blaze forth. There's a little bit of Nietzsche in here, and like Nietzsche will be the next reading, so we'll talk about this. Callicles and Nietzsche seem to be very similar on the surface, but there's some significant differences between their argument. But this little part here, it's very Ubermensch. Um, you know, it's very Superman or Overman. Uh, Nietzsche does say that, you know, um, the truly good life is one where you can shake off the morals and the norms of society and embrace your will to power. And that's kind of what Callicles is talking about here. As I said, there are significant differences between Socrates, uh, between Callicles and Nietzsche that we'll discuss, but this idea of someone rising up and shaking off the society's norms, it's a very Nietzschean idea. Uh, I think Pindar is making the same point at, uh, as me in the poem where he says, law, lord of all, both gods and men. And law, he continues, instigate ex instigates extreme violence with a high hand and calls it right. Uh, Heracles, uh, Heracles um, or Hercules, deeds are proof of this, since without um, paying for them, uh, something like that. I don't know the actual words, but he says that um, Heracles, which is another name for Hercules, drove off Graian's castle without paying for them and without Graian giving them uh, to him, presumably because he, it was uh, natural justice for him to do so in the sense that all the belongings of the worse, inferior people, not just their cattle, are the property of a man who is better and superior. So what um, Callicles is saying here is, if you're a weak person, or you know, if I'm stronger than you, then everything that you own is mine. You're just holding it for me. And any time I want to come and get it, I'll come and get it, and you can't stop me. Okay? Um, this is what is natural. Okay? This is the what you know, Callicles is arguing is the natural law. Might is right. If I can do something and no one can stop me, then I will do something. Okay. 
Um, this sort of ends that section of the tirade um, and this idea of the better and superior and stronger. It's important to note that um, Callicles is using these words interchangeably because Socrates is going to pick him up on that, like what he really means by better and superior. Uh, what we're going to see Callicles shift to now, um, and I'll change slides, is uh, he's going to now start to talk about um, basically what's wrong with Socrates and why he would say something so stupid like it's worse to uh, do wrong than to suffer wrong. Um, he's really going to have a crack at Socrates here. Okay, so these are the facts of the matter and you'd appreciate the truth of what I've been saying if only you'd forget about philosophy at last and turn to more important things. The point is, Socrates, it's fine for a person to dabble in philosophy uh, when he's the right age for it, but it ruins him if he devotes too much of his life to it. Even a naturally gifted person who continues to study philosophy far into life is bound to end up without the experience to have gained the accomplishments he ought to have, if he's to be a gentleman with some standing in society. So this is a very pointed attack at philosophy. Uh, sorry, at Socrates via philosophy. Um, Callicles is saying, look, philosophy is handy when you're young. You know, it teaches you to think in a certain way, but you should drop it um, once you've got those bare basics out of it because otherwise it's going to cripple you and you'll never become someone important if you study philosophy uh, for the rest of your life. Okay, um, it hurts. It hurts to read it, uh, but this is what he's saying. In actual fact, philosophers don't understand their community's legal system or how to address either political or private meetings or what kinds of things people enjoy and desire. In short, they're completely out of touch with human nature. When they do turn to practical activity, then in either a private or a political capacity, they make ridiculous fools of themselves, just as I imagine politicians make fools of themselves when they're faced with your lots, discussions and ideas. In other words, uh, Euripides was right when he said, a person shines at and expends his energy on and devotes most of his waking hours to the activity at which he happens to excel. He shuns and reviles anything he's no good at and sings the praises of, of his own specialty uh, in a self-regarding way because he thinks this will increase his own prestige. So he's really having a go at Socrates here saying, the only reason that you like philosophy is because you're good at it. It is utterly useless and you get all superior because you argue with people about stupid stuff that means nothing. Um, and you feel like you beat them in an argument when at the end of the day, they're actually doing important things. You're not. Um, okay. The reason that they can't match you in an argument is because you argue in a stupid philosophical way instead of a real world way. Uh, is kind of what he's saying. Uh, it seems to me that the optimum course is to have a foot in both camps. A certain amount of philosophy helps one to become a cultured person, and it's fine to take uh, to take it that far. There's nothing wrong with uh, studying philosophy in one's teens, but it's a ridiculous thing for a person still to be studying philosophy even later in life, Socrates. I feel the same way about doing philosophy as I do about stammering and playfulness. I enjoy seeing a child stammer or stumble over their words and play games when he's still young enough for this kind of behavior to be expected from him. It's pleasantly unaffected, I think, and appropriate to the child's age. When I hear a child, a young child coming out with fluent sentences, however, it seems harsh and grates on my ears and strikes me as degrading somehow. On the other hand, the phenomenon of a grown man stammering or playing childish games seems ridiculous and immature, and you want to give him a good thrashing. So in other words, Callicles is basically saying, the way you carry on, Socrates, you're like a child. And when you do it, I want to punch you in the face. This is what he said to him here. That's how I feel about people who do philosophy as well. I don't mind seeing a young lad take up philosophy. It seems perfectly appropriate. It shows an open mind, I think, whereas neglect of philosophy at this stage signifies pettiness and condemns a man to a low estimation of his own worth and potential. On the other hand, when I see an older man who hasn't dropped philosophy but is still practicing it, Socrates, I think it is he who deserves a thrashing. 
You see, as I said a moment ago, under these circumstances, even a naturally gifted person isn't going to develop into a real man, because he's avoiding the heart of his community and the thick of the agora, which are the places where, as Homer tells us, a man earns distinction. So the agora was sort of the meeting place for all of the people of importance. And for Socrates famously avoided it. Uh, he didn't like want to take part in that world. Um, but Callicles is saying, no, if you want to be someone, you need to run headlong into that world um, and you need to prove yourself there. Uh, instead, he, the philosopher, spends the rest of his life sunk out of sight, whispering in a corner with three or four young men rather than giving open expression to important and significant ideas. This is a pointed attack at what Socrates would do. Uh, I'm quite fond of you, Socrates, believe it or not, and that's why I react to you in the same way as it happens that uh, Euripides had Zethus, uh, whose words I quoted a moment ago, react to Amphion. I'm moved to copy Zethus uh, talking to his brother and say, Socrates, you're neglecting matters you shouldn't ne neglect. Look at the noble temperament with which nature has endowed you. Yet what you're famous for is behaving like a teenager. So Callicles is saying here, look at your ability to speak and to hold people's attention. Look at the natural ability you have and you're wasting it on stupid childish things, uh, namely philosophy. Uh, you couldn't, and this is where Callicles is now going to make reference to uh, the trial of Socrates, even though it hasn't happened in this timeline. Remember Plato's writing this afterwards so he knows what's going to happen to Socrates. This section is a pointed uh, remark about Socrates' death. You couldn't deliver a proper speech uh, to the councils which administer justice or make a plausible and persuasive appeal or put passion into a proposal designed to help someone else. And yet, my dear Socrates, now please don't get cross. It's because I'm fond of you that I'm going to say this. Isn't this state an embarrassment for you and anyone else who keeps going deeper and deeper into philosophy? The point is that you or any of your sort, sorry, that if you or any of your sort were seized and taken away to prison, unjustly accused of some crime, you'd be incapable, as I'm sure you're well aware, of doing anything for yourself. With your head spinning and mouth gaping open, you wouldn't know what to say. And uh, and if, when you appeared in court, you were faced with a corrupt and unprincipled prosecutor, which he was, you'd end up dead if it was the death penalty he wanted, which he did. O oh, Socrates, what a clever discovery this is. It enables you to take a naturally gifted person and ruin him. It makes a person incapable of defending himself or of rescuing himself or anyone else from terrible danger. The best he can hope for is that his enemies will steal all his property and let him live on in his community with no status whatsoever, which would make his situation such that anyone could smash him in the face, if you'll pardon the extravagant expression, and not be punished for it. What Callicles is saying here is Socrates is going to strip people of their importance um, uh, philosophy, rather, is going to strip people of their importance to such an extent that anyone will be able to take whatever they want from them. Uh, if they wanted to, they could just walk up to them and punch them square in the face and then just walk on. No one would, be, no one would do anything. Um, so this is the point that, Socrates, uh, that Callicles is making. And as we said before, he's directly referenced what happens to Socrates. Socrates goes to court. It's not quite the way that Callicles says it, but he gets, you know, uh, put to death for charges that weren't correct. Um, so, no, Socrates, please take my advice and stop your cross-examinations. Practice the culture of worldly affairs instead and take up the kind of occupation which will make your wisdom famous and leave to others the subtle root of spouting drivel and rubbish. These are the right kinds of terms for it, which leaves you living in a deserted house. Don't model your behavior on these quibblers, but on people who make a living and earn a great many benefits for themselves, not the least of which is prestige. So prestige is a really important concept to Callicles. It's sort of like you're standing in society. It's how important you are. Um, this was really important. Uh, remember the structure of, uh, of the Athenian society. 
um, prestige was an important thing. The way that others looked up to you was really important because you could get stuff done if they did. And if you couldn't, then you were at the mercy of people like Callicles who could. Um, and this is really what Callicles is saying to Socrates. Philosophy has turned you into someone who is completely vulnerable to everyone. And this is the most contemptible position to be in because anyone could do anything they want to you, Socrates, and no one would do anything about it, at least of all you. There's no way that you'd be able to do anything about it. So it really has a go at, uh, at Socrates here. Um, all right, for extra bonus points, there is a reference to something to do with Harry Potter in that section of the reading. 10 points to Gryffindor for the person who finds it. Um, but... Uh, like and subscribe. Hope you enjoyed this reading from the Handy Philosopher and uh, I'll see you in class.